Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Record Breakfast Bar. Here we speak with different people involved in the business landscape, share their expertise, delve into the latest tech trends, and explore the ins and outs of IT, of course. I'm Alex Sarikov, and today I'm excited to have Rick Fergus, an experienced executive with a demonstrative history of working in the financial services industry. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss new episodes. Hi, Rick. To start, could you tell us a bit about yourself and your professional background? Sure. Um, winding long journey as I get more gray in my beard, <laughs> my, my experience gets longer. Um, started on the trading floor at the CME. I had a couple, you know, series of things. I traded some currencies, some bonds, some interest rate products, things like that. I ended my career down there when it went electric. And I went upstairs and basically started a pseudo high frequency trading system, which I sold to a bank. At that point, I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up. So I went into financial service, got a little ball of money that I earned from the buyout. I realized I hated it. No, I wasn't fit. Sitting at a desk was not cut out for me at the time. So I became what's called a wholesaler. And that means I go out and sell financial advisors, my services to sell to their clients. And that was a lot of fun because it involved getting on planes and eating with people, talking to people. And that's what I do. For, you know, I love talking to people. So I learned a lot about business structures and how people run their businesses and financial service predominantly, but a lot of other things. And then I got caught in the 07, 08 stuff and they, uh, we were bought by a little firm called Prudential and Prudential didn't need another wholesaler. So I went off and created a firm called Connect Lending and we grew that to be the fourth, fourth, fifth largest alternative lending platform in the country. And yeah. my partner and I sold that. And I, again, moved off and the stuff we had learned there, we took some of that knowledge of processes and paperwork and what we had to do. And we built Forms Logic. <laughs> and so Forms Logic ends up being a, a passion of mine because it solves a real problem. And the fun thing in business is you got to have a problem to solve. You don't wake up in the morning. So that's what, you know, in a 30,000 foot view, that is who I am and what I am. That's Amazing. Great experience. Could you share a story that highlights a significant challenge you faced in your career and how you overcame? Well, I mean, if you ever wake up in the morning, you find challenges every single day. <laughs> um, especially if you're a business owner. Yeah, especially if you're a business owner. Sometimes you don't go to sleep. Sometimes you work right through the night. So, you know, it depends on the challenge. One of my most significant challenges was growth. You know, when you start growing, and you start having to turn over what you do because you're passionate about it to some of your staff. You expect them to do what you do, but they don't. They are there for, because they believe in the company at the beginning, but paychecks, right? They're there for earning a paycheck for their family, you know? So my biggest challenge is turning over responsibilities that I started and built and crafted and I think are the best in what I do, turning them over and watching them grow and morph and change into what somebody else is doing, probably one of my biggest challenges is letting go. And as the company has grown, now there's people that give other people tasks. I'm two, three, four removed now. So my problem now is when I look over at a process and two people are doing the same thing I used to do, I look back and go, why is there two people? And they explain to me that now that we're bigger, things are changing. And I'm like, okay. So that is probably one of the biggest challenges is success, right? That's so horrible to say it that way. But once you get over a certain hump and you're not a, everyone's a startup at all times, because you know, until you're IBM, everybody's a startup, is letting other people and processes help you grow. How many people are in your company? Right now, I think we're at 18 or 19. A lot of that growth has come in the last two, two and a half years. So a lot of coders were brought on because we have five years worth of backlog work to do. You know, you start with an idea and you start growing and then improvements happen and you, you do things, but then you can go back and you got to solidify all of it. <laughs> so it's not built on bad code. So we're constantly in the process of redoing things that we've done 10 years ago that weren't mm -hmm. built to have six, seven, 8,000 clients on it. 
Wow, great. With your extensive uh, experience, what changes or trends do you foresee shaping the future of the financial service industry? You know, I'm going to say the can phrase AI, because AI is going to change everything, right? <laughs> Until you realize that in financial services where we play, broker dealers, registered investment advisors, custodians, things like that, no AI is going to write a program because some of these programs have never been written. So AI is great at taking things that have already been done that are public and bringing it forward and helping you. The problem is when it's never been written before, you have to go do that. There is no AI that can help you. <laughs> at this stage. At this stage, right, and that's true. But again, that's a great conversation point of, at what stage do you believe that that ghost employee that's not real kept your best interest in mind and didn't expose something that they weren't supposed to expose? At the end of the day, you as an owner of a business are responsible for every single thing that happens in your business. So AI is a great tool to start a process. And it's really been good for note-taking and time management and things that are not mission critical. But, you know, there are people now where we do marketing when I get, the one thing they say is don't let AI write your scripts or your marketing or PR because it'll say things it's not supposed to say. So marketing is not, way, it's in not way, there yet. <laughs> I will say in the, in the way that you clearly recognize that it's done by AI and that's a problem. Yeah, That's right. to what you're saying. But the good news is if you're an inventive person and you're solving a problem, that problem is there because AI hasn't figured it out yet or somebody hasn't figured it out yet. I mean, we fill out forms and we do workflow processes, but the fact is that should be child's play for an AI. The problem is there's so much sophistication in what we do. It, it took us 12 years to get to where we are. If AI can do it in six, I would be really impressed. Who knows? Who knows? Even half a year ago, okay, not half a year ago, one yeah. year ago, I wouldn't say that it's possible to do something similar that Sora does now. So yeah. We well, the one thing I laugh about is you, li you listen to those at Stanford, MIT, that always audits the new chat GBTs and all that. It's getting worse and worse at basic math. It's getting great at doing other things, but it, it doesn't like math anymore. Math never changes. But why is their answers changing? <laughs> it's not perfect yet. And, you know, I, I yeah. keep telling people, AI is only as smart as the coders who wrote it and the ability to, to have as wide of a net as they'll let it cast. Okay. I hope we can talk in a few years to see. <laughs> well, we'll see. Maybe we'll be talking to each other via AI. You'll think you're talking to me, but you won't be. Who knows? See in the metaverse. That's still a thing I heard too. <laughs> okay. It could be, but I think it didn't go as well as Meta planned it to go, yeah. to be honest. Well, you can plan for things to be better than current hardware, but until hardware catches up, until people like me die that didn't grow up with a headset attached to my face, I'm never going to walk into a department store on the Meta where it's trying to pair pants that I can't feel. So until that changes, people like me die. There's a whole generation that won't embrace it, and we're the ones that write the checks. So that's a, that's a bit of a problem. How do you navigate the scarcity in the highly competitive fields of AI and data analytics? And what strategies have you employed to attract and retain top talent? It's a great question. What I usually tell people is I'm a data company with a forms problem. So, <laughs> you know, it's somewhat humorous, right? This was amazing. People chipped in things to make words, right? Then they grabbed pens and pencils. And then there was this huge step forward where they put it on the web and they called it a PDF. That's still akin to chipping with a piece of stone. So we and a bunch of other firms have taken that step of saying everything that you write or every box you fill out is a data point. And if you can normalize all those data points, you have something to work with now. And you have some data to work with now. So the interesting thing is what we do now isn't necessarily just filling out a form. It's using some predictive analysis of what's going to be on the form. It's predictive analysis of what forms do you need. If you check this box, and it's conditional logic, and it's the simplest of everything you can imagine, but... When you start filling out a piece of paper and another piece of paper magically appears behind your other physical piece of paper, that's magic. Online, it's just called a business process. So things that we take for granted that we do are sophisticated these days.
now you take all the data you have and you can run analysis on things like how many times do I say, um, in this podcast, how many times do I put a comma where you're not supposed to have one, things like that. So there's data. And what we talk about is data in between the data. How mm -hmm. long did it take you to fill out your form is, is, is it actually a data point we keep. How many times did you write something, hit save, and then go back and change what you already saved? Now people look at that and say, were you lying? Were you changing your questions based on answers further down in the form? You know, there's a lot of things that are happening on forms now that you can never do on a PDF or a piece of paper, but only do in a web environment. Understanding that you have had experience with outsourcing, could you shed light on how your development team is structured specifically? Uh, how do you navigate the dynamics between in-house talent and outsourced resources to ensure right. seamless collaboration? Right. So my, my partner, Fred, taught me a long time ago, when you outsource, you save a lot of money, but you don't save a lot of time. And he, he explained that to me. And, and I'm, I'm going to say things that I know sometimes are politically correct, because <laughs> I just don't do that. You know, when we outsourced to the traditional, what you would think of as India, you know, those sorts of countries, we, we started there to fill out reports, to build reports, to build things that we thought were very simple. There's data, we want it in a certain way, and then you send it, right? The problem was my partner told me he's significantly more adapted coding than I am. He said, I'm going to teach you a lesson, Rick. You go deal with this report. One report we're generating, right? It took me almost four months of twice a week meetings to get one report near what we would consider completed. And it was things like spacing. It was things like punctuation. Do you want commas in your numbers? That wasn't specified. So you have to go tell them. You have to put a dollar sign. You have to put a comma every three going from the left, you know, all that kind of stuff. And the lesson I was taught was, Sometimes you have to write the requirements offshore so specifically, it might have been worth your time to just do it yourself. Because if I got to go to the detail of telling you put commas and numbers and things like that, that's problematic, right? So that's one. Now you get near shore. Now near shore is, you know, English speaking countries that know what we do, no commas. But the problem we get now is we still get people that don't know how our addresses work. So we have to spend time working with addresses and working with phone numbers that you don't need a country code if you're in the United States, stuff like that. It sounds really trivial, but that's time. That's time and effort you spend on things. And it's buried in code that will show up two, three, four, five years later when you don't expect it to and blow something up. And then you got to dig for a day or two to find it. Right? So the nearer you can get, to people that are commonalities of language and understanding of just general things you do, the more time you save in having to teach them or audit mm -hmm. their work. So for us, all of our coders are English speaking. They write in what's called Scala, which is the code we write in. We are fortunate enough to grab some of the most top talented people that write in that code and they're very good at communicating. So, you know, we have things where we do virtual standups because no one's in the same office anymore. Everybody's outsourced. Um, yeah, COVID changed the rules. Oh yeah, the landscape has changed. But at the end of the day, they are talking together and we do these little mini groups where, you know, we have a guy named Vlad and Vlad's our CTO now because he has proven himself the ability to be a mentor to other coders. And the way it was explained to me when I first started was, I can take a smart person and make him a coder. I can't take a dumb coder and make him smart, right? So the question really becomes, you want to surround yourself with smart people that can help find things and fix problems before you even need to know their problems. You're telling us about your partner. Who is your partner? There's two or three of them now. As we've grown, we've brought in more C-suite people. Originally it was Fred, a guy named Fred. Oh, Fred advised you about outsourcing. Oh right? yeah. Fred advised me about all this stuff. And you know, he's a serial entrepreneur at heart. <laughs> so he stubbed his toe and all this stuff. He and I have had almost four companies together now. So the thing is 
he told me once we were at a party or something at a client's party and he said, Rick, you know, it's interesting. Most coders dream of someone taking what they wrote and selling it to a client. He goes, it's the first time he ever had someone like me that's a sales guy that's communicative. They could actually go sell something and then go write it. <laughs> so the first year or two of our life was me saying, yeah, we could do that. And Fred's got your notes after note after note, he had to go build things, you know? So the key was the mousetrap was sold before it was written. And you've heard the term vaporware, you know, the process, the problem was super simple. The problem was we want to fill out paperwork and we want to do it in a streamlined manner. We want to do all these things. It's super simple conceptually. How do you take concepts and put them into code to make it work? That's where the challenge is, right? And here we are almost 12 years after we started this company. The first couple of years, we only had maybe a half a dozen clients, but those half dozen clients told us exactly what we did right and wrong and what they wanted and how to fix things. And as a law changed, what had happened, how we had to fix things. You know, there's a term called MVP, and I know you know what that term is, minimum viable product. It chills my spine when someone says, just get to minimum viable product. All minimum viable product means is you think you can now charge a client. And I tell people all the time, go get a client, give them the product for free. Get your first client for free. They will absolutely tell you how horrible your code is, how bad your process is, how bad your UI UX is. They will tell you all of these things. That is what most firms pay for. They pay for them to tell them how bad things are, right? Just go get a client. They'll tell you. Yeah, it's called audit. <laughs> there you go. Um, or beta testing. Right. And the, and the interesting thing is I now have a lot of clients that tell me what I do right and wrong. Some are fans, some are not fans. And, and the way we've built our company and why we're growing so fast is very simple. I give every client that requests something, right? I say very simply, I don't want to make any money on that upgrade unless you don't let me share it with everybody else. Then I have to make money on that time and margin, right? So if you were to tell me your shirt needs a collar, right? Super simple. It's a great request. I think everybody should know that and everybody should have that option. So when we build something, we turn around and we basically offer it to every new client and every old client, because mm -hmm. some of the best processes we have were from one person telling us their problem and how to fix it. And then we back it in to all of our clients and they go, that's amazing. We would love to do that, but I'd like to do it this way or that way. So at the end of the day, I got QAs, I got testers, I got all these things happening from one guy or girl requesting one upgrade for one little piece of a process. We don't know what you're go we don't know what their challenges are because we're removed. We're a vendor to them. We knew originally, but now the world has moved and evolved and changed so much. The simplest of things like, hey, can you integrate with this little piece of software is a massive win for us. So get a client, they'll tell you <laughs> exactly what you should be doing. In your opinion, what are the main advantages and disadvantages of IT outsourcing and how do you navigate these factors to maximize the benefits? So if you have something that doesn't require independent thinking, and this is that whole in, you know, onshore, offshore, most people that are coders offshore, they don't want to make decisions. They just want to pound code and they want to get to an end result to deliver something. So if you ask them, Hey, there's this kind of process that we're looking for you to build that can't be offshore because they don't understand. I think this is the goal that we have to get to because it'll end up being over here or over here, or they won't start at all. So things that are very, very specific and very easy to understand, here's the goal, here's the steps, here's the end result. That could be offshore because there's an easy to follow process and, and template there. The moment you introduce something that has to have free thinking and how you build the code and how you get to the end result, that's when you run into offshore problems and you know, outsource problems. Anything that you're building that requires nuance or not quite understanding what you're building yet, but you can still start processing it, that should be done by you or someone on your close-knit team because there are tons of communication that has to happen in real time. 
and you've never seen a coder as angry as when you get all the way through something, you say, eh, it's not quite right, start over. <laughs> they really don't like that, I don't know why. But the whole point of it is if you can touch them along the process and keep some boundaries, but give them enough free thinking, you'll get what you want, it'll be amazing. But unless you can define the boundaries and have them free think in the middle of that, that's when you're gonna run into some problems. I, I don't know if that exactly depends. answered your question. It's the best way I can no, describe it. Uh, that one of the probably benefits, advantages and disadvantages. Do you have any other? Well, I mean, the common thought process has always been offshore is cheaper, so you can get more talent to work on things. Mm -hmm. And my partner always told me you can't get a girl pregnant with nine guys in a month, right? The whole point is it's a process. Coding is a process. You build, you test, you build, you test, you know, everything builds on itself. Just throwing bodies at it in massive amounts of effort, don't make code write itself faster, right? That's the problem. So in our world, we went with the highest coders we can afford with the most talent, not with the most we can afford with the most amount of brain power, because the end result was never what we could get the, 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 so the way we do it. So you went over quality versus quantity. We went uh, with quality over quantity. Yeah, that's definitely the right approach, especially in software development. But I would like to talk more about your first concern when a developer should take responsibility and deliver the value, not just code, but to deliver, to understand he uh, delivers from the business perspective. Yeah, I agree that it's pretty common in IT outsourcing, but there are a lot of positive scenarios when it works. Oh yeah, there is. And it depends mostly on the person rather than on the factor that it's IT outsourcing. I think it depends. You're right. You, you, if, from... you have a, if you have a consultant in the middle that understands what you're doing and they can communicate to their team effectively, and that's sort of the model of outsource. You, the client, there's someone in the middle of you and the, a team if that person can identify your requirement and communicate it effectively and manage to it correctly, then yeah, it can work very well. The problem I always run into is that person has 15 clients or they keep stacking on work. It's not about servicing a client well, it's about how many clients can you get in, right? To the, the meat grinder. At least that's been our experience. So, okay. you know, from our standpoint, you have the disconnect between coders and business processes is massive, right? Our world is I run the business side and I run the sales side and I run the customer support side. My partner runs the IT and tech and delivery side. So when we get a problem in, it's always a business person and a coder have to sit down and figure out what that problem is. There's no independent think of one way or another. A business person dreams up a solution takes it to the IT person and says, here, this is what I need you to do. That is going to run into massive problems because they just stepped across 10 pieces of code that are all gonna break. <laughs> that uh, little thing has caused massive ripples. Do you know how we resolve this for our clients? That's right, we bring additional layer, this layer called business analyst, and he transforms the requirements from the business side to developers. So basically he creates user stories that are clear and that's his goal to create clearly defined, testable, uh, understandable user stories that developer just implements. Yeah, done. Yeah. That helps a lot, but of course a developer should understand the high level and he doesn't need to know all tiny business details, that's the goal of business analysts. But if you bring a business analyst, he can cover many of your developers, especially if he works full time on your project. He fully right. dedicates, then I think you shouldn't have the issue you described. Well, and that is where we've run into the problem of finding that middle person. Because okay. usually the middle person is from the company, not from us. So it's not like we put our middle person in that understands our business model. We have to bring in someone from their side. And now there's education 
of what we do. And you have to almost bring them from original code up to where it is today. So they know the evolution of how you got there. Because the first thing I always ask is how much of my code do you want to rewrite when I bring you in? And the answer is, oh, all of it. No. Okay. That's the, the typical answer of all developers. <laughs> yeah. Right. Cause nobody wants to work on somebody else's code because it's a different language. It truly is a language and it's dialect, right? It's how people write Scala over here and over here and over here are very different. So when we talk about it, our coders are turning in code to the CTO who has to sort of massage it to fit the puzzle, right? So they build the process that works. Well, sometimes the connectivity and how it touches other things wasn't thought through correctly, or maybe not all the way through. So that's where there's layers of deployment where we would rather spend our time than layers of development. In your experience, what criteria do you prioritize when selecting outsourcing partners and how do you ensure alignment with your project objectives and timelines? That's a great question. We have churned through a few people over the years that just couldn't keep up with the pace of which we code. So mm -hmm. we're not writing massive, massive, massive code pieces, you know, total structures every day, right? There's little pieces. What we're doing now is we're putting the flesh on existing skeleton and fixing little things. So what that means is when a problem shows up, that's a production issue. It's gotta be done now, like right now, drop what you're doing, fix this. It needs to be done in the next hours, not days, not months, not next sprint <laughs> now. So when you have those sort of requirements where someone has to get pulled from something to fix, do this, do that. And you gotta have the talent to be able to go back to what you were doing go down the level of the depth of where you were when you stopped <laughs> and then keep going, right? This is one of those business challenges you asked me about at the beginning is a coder in our world has to be fast enough and smart enough to disconnect from the process they're in, put on the other hat, go into another set of code, you know, same code, different side, fix an issue, make sure it's tested, make sure it's deployed, come back and then re-engage where they were. That is a trait it's hard to find in coders. Coders in my world tend to like to go down a path all the way to the end and not be bothered, deliver everything, and then work on the next task. That's just not how real business works with us because we are a lean team and we're growing very fast and we're hiring and hiring more people, but we're looking for intelligent people that can self-manage and juggle multiple things is really what's most important to us. Those guys called developers, not coders. Developers. See, that's why I'm on the business. The guys, <laughs> the guys who take responsibility, deliver, not all developers, but coders who code, they we don't actually, do what you expect. To, to your point then, we hire developers. We don't hire just coders because we have not been able to figure out how to get them to understand our business model yet. Or maybe we're mm -hmm. just not big enough that we have verticals that a coder can sit and not be bothered. Looking forward, do you anticipate an increased reliance on IT outsourcing? How do you envision this trend shaping the future of talent acquisition? We're, we're running into a very interesting spot right now in our growth pattern. And that is our ability to interact and connect with other vendors. So as we get a client, that client believes in the story of we own data, right? So if you think about it from that side of the world, the first thing you have to understand is who owns the data, who owns what we mm -hmm. would call the gold source of data. So the gold source of data is the last transaction that's most up to date with the most accurate information, the most complete data, right? Someone has to stand up and say, we own that. Everyone mm -hmm. gets to connect to that. Sometimes it's us, sometimes it's not us. And then we have to build processes to go touch and pull and push. But where we are today is, you know, a great example is CRMs. There are financial service CRMs, Wealthbox and Redtail are two big ones in our world. We've integrated with both of those firms. Well, both of those firms are also now asking us to go update them and then send something to eMoney and then send something over to here and then send something over to there and have it all tie back in 
And what you're talking about now isn't just filling out paperwork. It's about managing resources and data across multiple platforms you don't even touch. So what ends up happening is we spend a lot more time now with our vendors building relationships. And for the first four or five years, we knew we did something differently because we would find massive, massive errors in our vendor codes, API codes, that were basically inoperable. How are you using this? Because we can't figure out how to use it unless you fix this. Well, then we would fix it and it would work fine. So what ends up happening is we know we do it differently and we know we are a data centric operator. You know, we're not pushing forms around anymore. We're pushing massive amounts of data around and other things like that. And other vendors just aren't used to people like us. So that's where we are now is in this world of, I'm looking for more talented people that can do integration work that not necessarily means business process, but you got to know how it interacts with us. As we wrap up our conversation, what advice uh, would you give to other companies considering IT outsourcing? Well, it would be very simple. It would be, where are you in your journey as a company? <laughs> and then I'll give you the right advice. I think outsourcing and on, you know, in-housing is a path. It's not a straight line. It's not a, something you decide on when you start. It's going to be something where it's a very attractive model at the beginning because of the cost. Until you realize that it is going to cost you a lot more than you think, because you gotta spend a lot more time there. So a lot of the business people don't understand what the value of their time is when they factor in the cost of that IT coding and developer work. So there's a disconnect there. I would say spend the money at the beginning to find a partner, um, a coder, a developer, whoever, whatever you wanna call that, it's in-house, you pay for, you support, and they know everything about your business model and how it affects the code. Over time, as you take your journey, there will be projects, there will be opportunities, there will be things that show up where you need to do massive amounts of code and deployments in a very quick, rapid manner. Then you go out and find help. And that's a project specific, that's a time specific, a growth specific. Um, there is no right answer of you should do it all the time. Some of the time it's depending on your business model and where you are in the journey. And I hate to say it this way, where you are in your cash flow. That's really the most important thing. You got to know when and where to pull those triggers at. I would tell anybody that's starting a business or developing a business, find a mentor that's been through this journey and they can help you decide when and where to pull those triggers. Cause there's lots of people that say they can do things and they can't. Thanks for the advice, Rick, and thanks for joining me today. It was a pleasure for me to speak with such an experienced executive as you. I'm sure our guests will find some information useful. I wish you all the best in your journey. Uh, if you enjoy our discussion and want to stay updated on future episodes, don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. That way you will not miss some latest insights and conversations from the Recall Breakfast Bar. See you next week.